Hello and welcome to another edition of this program which focuses on Thailand's national treasures. I'm Mimi Gratchanatara. The foodies the world over have become enamoured with the wonders of Thai cuisine. And I'm certain that they'd be equally smitten by royal Thai cuisine if they'd known about its cultural significance. Now the differences are subtle, but royal Thai cuisine is in fact a lifestyle, a genre of cooking that was available only to the privileged few. Today we talk to some chefs about their interpretation of this unique culinary culture. Known and loved around the world for its fiery and rich components, Thai cuisine is loved for the melange of flavours that leave almost anyone who tastes it completely spellbound. A poem famously written by King Rama II mentions a Thai dish known as Masaman. The poem describes the potpourri of spices that make up this delightful dish, meticulously prepared for him by a woman he was in love with. ดีค่ะยันอาจารย์เวนดีนะสงขลานะคะเป็นเจ้าของโรงเรียนสอนอาหารครัวเวนดีและวิทยาลัยเทคโนโลยีครัวเวนดีค่ะทุกคนคงจ
that Royal Thai Cuisine is really, really difficult to replicate because I don't have a kitchen brigade of 40 to 50 women to cook my food every day. Um, but I do know that it, the food was very in detail, the decoration was a very elaborate, and that the ingredients I used were generally of a higher quality than the normal food you found during that era. So at Bolan we use a lot of old cookbooks, um, some of them being memorial books from the people of wealth or the courts. Um, we also source all of our ingredients from local uh, producers. Nothing we use is from outside of Thailand, so local to us is within Thailand. Um, as much of it as possible is organic and sustainable. All our animals that are sourced are all uh, ethically raised, so we won't use any farmed or caged animals. And they're all killed in accordance to what we believe is a a moral way of killing an animal. We're trying to preserve Thai food heritage by using traditional techniques. For example, all our curry paste at Bolan, we use a mortar and pestle still to pound everything from scratch. And we believe that passing that knowledge on to the guys in our kitchen means we can safeguard that knowledge as well. Uh, a lot of the cookbooks we use, we have a collection of probably over two, 300 books at this stage. Uh, as I said, a collected. We go through antique markets and we try and find books that are of interest to us. They have all old Thai recipes in them. Some of them, uh, some of them are only 40, 50 years old. Others are closer to maybe 150 years old. Um, but we use the books as an inspiration for coming up with our dishes as a guide to what we should and shouldn't be doing. So for example, if we want to do a curry, we will look at several recipes from several different uh, families and decide what's the most important aspect of that curry that is in every curry and what's sort of a family trait or what's a family have put into it themselves. And then we decide ourselves, okay, we need to use this, but what are we going to put into it to make it our own style? Okay, so I'm going to start with a genkilek. Genkilek is a cassiola leaf curry. Um, and the most important part of the curry is the curry paste, so we're going to start with that. Um, it's essentially a red curry paste, so we have coriander root, a uh, coriander seed, white pepper and a little bit of toasted cumin in here. And then we have the zest of the kaffir lime, coriander root. When making a curry paste, it's really important to start with the hardest, most fibrous ingredients first and work your way through to the softest. Never add the next ingredient until the paste has uh, achieved a really fine paste. For this one, we need dried red chili. We've just soaked in a little bit of water and some fresh bird's eye chilies. And then after that we put in the galangal. Okay, after the galangal we put the lemongrass. The finer you cut the lemongrass before you make your paste, the easier it's going to be to pound it. Okay, and then what makes this kilek again kua is the, is the grilled dried fish. So this is a pla grop which is a planoa on, which is a young freshwater fish that's been dried in the sun and then just grilled to get fragrant. We just want to remove the skin and take the flesh. This will give the curry a nice smoky quality. Okay, and then it gets easier from now on. So then we add our karachai, which is like a wild ginger. And then we add our garlic. To finish, we add our shrimp paste, the guppy. The guppy, you want to be careful. If you put too much in, it's going to be too salty, and too little, it's not going to have enough body. Okay, that's done, the curry paste. So while we're frying out the curry paste, I'm just going to marinate and grill the fish. And fish sauce. And then I'm just going to pop it on the grill to get it nice and smoky. Now we're going to cook our curry. We start with some coconut cream. And we just boil it until the fat begins to separate like this. So you can see when you simmer the cream, the fat begins to separate on the side here. That's when the curry, the coconut cream is ready to be cooked in the case. And fry to a medium, medium high heat. It shouldn't be super hot because you need to cook it out long enough so that everything's cooked. But also if it's too high, the dried spices in it will scorch. Yeah. And when you're frying a your curry out, you'll smell it in the opposite direction that you pounded it. So all the wet ingredients first, your shallots, the garlic, and then your lemongrass, galangal, dried fish, and finally you'll smell the dried spice. That's when you know it's ready to season. 
So while it's frying out, I'm going to add some nampara. Nampara is a fish sauce that we've made out of fermented fish. Um, as nice as that sounds, it actually in the curry is actually quite lovely. It gives it a velvety texture and gives it a very certain fragrance, but it's actually quite desirable. Another indicator of uh, whether the curry is cooked or not is the appearance. So when it, the fat begins to come out again and it has like a scrambled egg consistency, it's probably pretty close. The palm sugar we're using is 100% coconut, no, nothing else. Uh, that's why it's really soft at room temperature. That's why we have to keep it in the fridge, otherwise it'll melt. So by adding the sugar as well, you're increasing the heat, which helps to fine, uh, finish frying off those dried spice. And then we're gonna add a little bit of fish sauce. With our fish sauce, we're gonna be quite careful though, because uh, it's already got the guppy in there, the shrimp paste, and it's also got the namplara, which is also salty. So we just need a small amount of fish sauce. We have our coconut milk. You've got the head of the coconut and the tongue of the coconut, the tail. It's the milk. Add a fair amount because we're going to simmer it for a little while. So then we put in our cafe lime leaf. We have to scrunch them up first to release the oils. And then we need our cassiola leaf. It's just been boiled so that all the bitterness is leached out of it. And we just shred it. It's similar but not the same as uh, like a boiled or fermented tea leaf. Now this needs to be simmered in the curry for about five minutes and it will change the curry, lighten the curry and colour slightly. I just have red and green chilli. I'm just going to cut it so we remove the seeds. And prepare some of the garnish lime leaf. For the wild ginger. So add our grachai, we'll add our chilies and our grilled fish. It's ready to serve. And then we just finish with a splash of coconut cream and the julian lime leaf that we did earlier. Sorry. I'm Chef Bo Songwisawa from Bolan, essentially Thai, Bangkok, Thailand. I think um, royal Thai cuisine, they have been developed, evolved with a knowledge, a thought, a wisdom of people who live in the palace. And for me, in the old days, palace like the hub of everything. If they do the trade with anyone, um, either like from the western or eastern sides like China or European people, they actually incorporate a little bit of other people in as well and make it like um, Thai in their understanding. Why Thai cuisine of the court in the old day, we may not have that chance to get the ingredients that come from either China or European country. So if you look in the old book, there is a lot of um, ingredients that is not available in Thailand as well. If we, I compare it today, so I probably say that the royal cuisine is, is, is just the cuisine that consumed by royal family, basically. Thai cuisine is the cuisine that people in Thailand, anywhere like, of any regions, consume it. Uh, we're gonna do some uh, dessert today. So like this one is called Bu Ngat. This one we're gonna do the relish. So I'm gonna do with the chili lilish. In Thailand, you probably have like two category, two big ones. Of the chili lilish, you either have the namprik or the lon. But this one is a special one, it's called namprik lon. I think the one who write the recipe cannot make up her mind like whether they're gonna be the namprik or the lon, so they mix it together. So really easy, you start from dry prawns and Thai garlic with the skin on, maybe it's five, and pile it up together. A little bit of the chili, a real small, real fragrant one. And this one is the snake skin pear fruit. We call it uh, rakam. You got sort of two type again, you got either rakam or sala. But this one we're gonna use rakam because it's more fragrant. It's gonna contribute to the sourness of this relish. And then 
the heli aubergines we take all the heli things out all the hair out leave only the aubergines and we're gonna cut it into wedges and slightly abuse it in the pestle and mortar so that our paste there I gonna obviously interpret the recipe a little bit and putting the fresh prawn in the relish as well so I just gonna shade it so that it's puffed up in the coconut cream so in the brass work we put the coconut cream in for the fragrance then our paste like you don't want to boil the coconut cream too much because you don't want the oil to come out you just need a creamy really smooth really velvety uh, textures of the dish and when it start to simmer a bit you see that uh, we're gonna put the prawn in and then we're gonna season it with um, palm sugar and fish sauce and then a touch of tamarind sauce and then you simmer it until it's thickened a little bit get the zest of the Asian citrus or we call it songsa in Thai and put it in the relish just to give it another um, the different temp that's good enough so I put this in and turn off the heat right so the, with the relish we eat with a lot of different shoots and herbs and our vegetables it's like a journey when you eat it with one thing it tastes quite different like so it's like a journey when you eat it with cucumber it would be one taste if you taste it with like the white turmeric it will change the flavors of the relish itself a little bit do the banana blossoms it's because it's oxidized really quickly so you need a bowl with a lamp juice solutions to keep the color really nice so some cucumber this one is the local rose apple some lovely Thai rose apples as well okra green beans some snake bean and then I have something on the grills over here as well it's the store beans I just grill it a little bit because it's really pendant, pendant and to grill it it makes it softer more palatable but it still got that characteristic that we love freshwater fish you got a quite a soft creamy velvety piglon you need something crispy crunchy to go with it so you uh, also the, create the contrast of the textures as well as the flavor as well So this is how you make coconut cream at home. You grated it and then you knead it, work with the um, warm waters. And in the warm water you can put like the pan and the sleeve so you got a really nice fragrance water to work with. And then you put it in the cheese cloth. And then squeeze it. And the rest if you want to keep it to put it on your grill as a smoke agent that will be nice and lovely and then you wait and the creams will come onto the tops and then the milk will just um, settle down and when you use it you scoop the cream to use and if you want to let it out with anything you use the milk to so let it out with so this is the dessert and it's come from the oral recipe as well Nom um, is a dessert that got root vegetables, banana, cinnamon, and coconut creams along with the dumplings. 
and the dumpling is made from like tapioca pearls, no tapioca flowers. So it gives you a really nice texture when you chew into it. So basically, what we do is we cut everything in a spoon size, in a bite size, and steep it into the lamb water. The lamb water will make the out, out a bit like crunchy but soft in size. And then we're gonna boil it. So coconut creams, an essential part of Thai dessert. In Thai dessert, normally you got coconut cream, sugar, and flowers of any kind. Pandan dust leaf is like vanilla to the Western cuisines. We put pandan dust leaf in every dessert. Just not to give the flavor of the pandan dust leaf, it's just a subtle flavor at the end and it gives you a nice fragrance. Coconut palm sugar. Well, Thai cuisine is about, about balancing the flavor. And even dessert, we put a little bit of salt in just to make sure that there is some balance in the flavor. Pumpkin in, taro in. Make with natural color. It comes from the wood called fang. And when you boil that wood in the water, it gives you a really, really red color. We're gonna just smoke this a little bit. So it's like a sapidilla uh, with agar agar inside. And the agar agar you can make any like flavor you like. We like to make either the pink or the red one because it's got contrast with the um, brownish of sapidilla. So sapidilla normally you got like a really soft texture. Um, but with agar agar it's add the texture so you have the contrast of the textures um, with this dessert as well. So we just take the centers of the sapadilla out and then pour in like the agar agar and then we, we, when we cut it, you got a really nice Chinese center with different flavor. So that's it. Bungat with the sapadilla and agar agar stuffing. Hi, I'm David Thompson and welcome to Nam, which is in the Metropolitan Hotel. Well, strangely enough, bizarrely enough, I'm cooking some Thai food in Bangkok. I am an avid collector of old Thai cookbooks because it allows me to understand an age that's past and it gives me an avenue to stroll down into a different culture, culinary culture, without which I wouldn't be able to cook as we do today at Nam. Many of those old cookbooks, which were published in the late 19th, early 20th century, are of regal descent. But Royal Thai food is such a nebulous beast to try and find and describe, really, because it was cooked for a certain type of people, for an exalted kind of people, really, where and they were treated to very complicated food, with carved dishes, carved fruits and vegetables, which is not really a part of what we do here at Nam, I, I hasten to say. What it has though given me is an insight into that distant, rarefied, into that distant rarefied culinary culture and has allowed us to bring some of the best of that Siamese cuisine onto the tables here today at Nam. Here we are in the kitchens at Nam and I'm just going to do the dish that I talked about previously, the jungle curry of salted beef with some wild ginger, some green peppercorns and some Thai basil. Simple and straightforward, though it might be to describe, there are a few stages that you need to go through before you start to cook. It's called what a cook calls mise en place preparation. I am going to make a small paste from some garlic with some chilies some little Thai chilies, some prickin usun, which are very spicy indeed, with uh, some buds of some Thai basil, and a little bit of wild ginger. It's a rather coarse paste. I need my garnish, which is some kaffir lime leaves, some tomatoes, some chilies, 
some wild ginger, gotta try, some green peppercorns, quite a lot of Thai basil, and my bai madan, which is sour leaves. And these are the little madan I was telling you about earlier on. These are like Spelimping, I think they're called further down south on the Malay Peninsula. They're a sour fruit and they're in season right now. Now this is a more rustic type of curry than uh, the regal curries that we sometimes serve. It's a robust curry because the tastes themselves are strong. Often palace food uh, has very refined techniques, very refined cutting and very refined tastes. I also need my curry paste, my red curry paste and some grilled salted beef which I need to pound up slightly and then tear into pieces. There we are, we have all of our ingredients for our curry. I'm using pork fat to fry off the garlic and wild ginger paste that I made up. I'm going to fry this paste until it's golden. Then I'll add some stock and the, the nuttiness from the fried garlic will enrich the curry paste that I will then dissolve into the simmering stock. You can see now it's starting to color quite nicely. And I'll add some stock very quickly and just a little bit of water. That's come to the boil very quickly indeed. I'm now going to add some curry paste. Not too much. I'm going to season it with some fish sauce. A pinch of palm sugar, not much, because this, this curry should be salty and spicy, but not too sweet. In fact, very little sugar indeed. So consequently, I'm adding the smallest amount of sugar to this curry. I'll add some kapi lime leaves, torn, a few tomatoes, and the salted beef that we grilled and shredded. Maybe a little bit more water. We'll let that simmer just for a minute or two. Now I'll add some of the shredded madan, which will introduce a, a pleasing tartness. Some wild ginger, and some sliced chilies. You notice that at each stage I'm tasting because Thai food, whether it is from the most regal of sources or the most base of markets, the importance of taste and balance in cooking this cuisine is crucial. I keep on adding water. Now I used to be somebody that used to always think that stocks were much superior to than water when making curries but I'm starting to change I'm starting to become more Thai I'm starting to uh, in my cooking at least anyway I'm starting to see the wisdom of those older Thai cooks who would often use water in preference to stock and for that touch of Siamese roulette a sliced chili a spicy chili or two. And there we have it, old-fashioned curry of salted beef, a relatively simple curry that's seasoned with fish sauce with, and, and chilies, and relatively simple components that are combined together to result in a spicy and salty curry, augmented with spices and herbs that makes Thai food such a, uh, an arresting such a delicious cuisine to eat and to cook. There we are. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. This has none of the refinement of, of Royal Thai food whatsoever. It is far more robust, far more real in some ways, I think, and hopefully more delicious too. This is the curry of salted beef with wild ginger madan, some tomatoes and some Thai basil. Oh, and salty beef too. older dishes I'd like to hasten to say that that uh, whilst there might be the dishes that I've found in these old cookbooks might have royal antecedents ancestors they are in fact democratized and 
cooked through little Australian hands, which are hardly regal or royal, I, I must tell you. Some of the dishes, you know, we have a gengarion that comes from an old cookbook, one of the first Thai cookbooks, and we have a manuscript of it uh, by a woman called Mom Som Jin. And it's just the technique is very unusual. Uh, so very different from the taste and methods of today's gengaris, the aromatic curries. But, you know, there are other dishes that are just as attractive as a, a, an extraordinary jungle curry with uh, some salted beef. Well, it was originally with some chicken, uh, with some chicken and with some madan, which is a sour cucumber-like uh, vegetable, with some Thai basil and some wild ginger. And it's, when you come across those dishes and some of those wonderful tastes, it's a revelation. It's more than a revelation, it's bloody delicious.